Hello, my beautiful people. I'm Elizabeth Molina, and I am your beauty guru. In this podcast, I will share with you all you need to know about beauty from the inside out. You will gain access to the latest beauty trends from head to toe, mind and soul. You will hear from experts themselves, the trendy influencers, celebrities, athletes, and of course, myself on all things beauty. This is definitely the place to be biohacking, beauty hacking, life hacking into the why for your beauty routine. Are you ready for your glow obsession? Thank you so much for joining us. As you know, I'm here to add value to your life and your loved ones with the information that I love to share with you, with all of these amazing people that I have met along the way through my journey. Today, we have an amazing person. Her name is Dr. Michelle Gordon, or she goes by Dr. G. She is a TV host, surgeon, athlete, and author. She was a former host and executive producer of the reality docudrama called Life Matters with Dr. Michelle Gordon that aired on the Sci-Fi channel. It was about seven women and they were addressed aging while enjoying the adventure of a lifetime in Spain. She is a board certified general surgeon and founder of the Gordon Surgical Group, a multi-specialty group practice in 2005. She also co-authored a book called Life Matters Cookbook with Chef Cassandra Kosha, recipes for living including a low carbohydrate and paleo inspired delicious meals that you can prepare at home. She is the founder of the menopause movement and it is a community for women to flourish through menopause and life. She founded this menopause movement when menopause hit her heart. And it was very frustrating for her, especially as a doctor, that there was nothing really out there, not much. And you know, we're gonna hear about that during the interview, but she set out and she started learning and getting information. And this information really transformed her life not just menopause but her life in general and so she created this community and now she is out there to help other women experience the same transformation that she has and so without further ado we're going to welcome dr g welcome dr g how are you Oh, I'm fantastic. I'm so happy to be here, Elizabeth. I'm so excited to have you here and get into, th- I'm going to just like start like not attacking you, but like just going in for the questions. I'm like, let's go. Right on. Get it to rum- <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. Okay. This is such okay. an important conversation to have because as women, they, I feel like there's not a lot of education in general about our menstruation and why it's good to have it, what it means. It's There's a lot of shame around it. It's like, mm. it's like, you got it and you're like cool because you got it and then you're like oh i got it like this isn't cool <laughs> right like it's like wait like you're waiting for what it what am i like, waiting I, for I, I think, yeah how old were you when you got your period i was 14 yeah okay i so i was 13 and i remember waiting you know i wanted it and wanted it and then like the first one was great it it just is a little bit of bleeding and then for the next 20 some odd 30 years it was like this disruptive week every single month and it, I got to the point where it was so disruptive that I just I I, I went to and took a pill and I was like I never ever got a period anymore oh wow and yeah yeah because I was uh, because I, I would I would get crazy and I wouldn't be able to perform and I was in surgery school and I was like oh my god and so I finally just I took a pill and just never got a period and when I went off of it I, I, I want I got to this point where I was like I gotta lose weight I couldn't stand it anymore right so I'm perimenopausal and I, I gained all this weight and I didn't know. I went off the pill and almost immediately I had this big fibroid grow. So like I put my hand on my belly one day and I had this big mass in my belly. And I was like, oh my God. So I went for an MRI and stuff. I ended up having uh, what's called a uterine artery ablation. Radiologist took a catheter and then cl- like blocked off the artery to that part of my uterus. And then, and then my that sounds fibroid. Painful. Well, it, the, the most painful part was getting an endometrial biopsy, which was basically the gynecologist going in through my cervix and then just scraping. Oh, my God. I'm- scraping the uterine wall. And, it, oh, God, it hurt so much. I mean, it, and then I cramped afterwards. Ugh. It was just, it was horrible. So I had that. And and if you've ever had a baby, it's 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 like labor, but you don't get a baby at the end. <laughs> you don't get the prize, <laughs> right? And so and then we and then the next week I did the uterine artery ablation. And what I didn't expect was the pain, 
So I, I went on a Friday. I spent the night in the hospital. And then I had to work on Monday. I was doing an operation. I had to do like a hernia or something. And I'm standing there. And, you know, as this as this this fibroid is degenerating inside of me. So basically, you know, I've got this bu- a bunch of dead tissue that's getting reabsorbed inside my abdomen. I'm, I'm sweating and I have all this inflammation and whatever. And so finally my anesthesiologist said, here, take some Toradol. Gave me a big shot of Toradol in the butt <laughs> and I got through my hernia. That just sounded horrific. So oh, we, we started with the period, right? Like no one talks about this period, this whole thing. And like even the days, like what that means as a surgeon, as a physician, as somebody who's educated, how do you take this news? Like how does that like in your brain, like how do you receive that? Like, oh, this is happening. Are you like mechanical about it? Are you like the woman behind the, like not the the patient, not the doctor? Like I want to know about that experience because we don't often get like the doctor being diagnosed with something and then they have to to experience it. Like the patient. Right. To so you mean to be the doctor patient? Yeah. What's that exactly. like? Exactly. I see. So so let's just go back to the biology. All of the eggs that you're ever going to produce are are created inside of your mom's uterus as you are a fetus if you're female. Okay? So those are called those are those have half of your genetic complement. You're only going to put out an X. And those are called gametes. Now, men constantly produce gametes which is not fair side note no it's not fair it's not fair um they're always making their sperm and and it's always fresh uh depending on what they're eating. yeah and us. then wait side note dr dr g i just want to say this is why women say my biological clock is ticking because people don't understand that our eggs were made while we were fetuses so we don't have anymore we can't make anymore we're just losing them every period is like actually yeah. A morning, like you just lost the possibility to procreate life again. So it's actually like, I don't know, in my opinion, I'm not an expert, but I, I see it as like a little bit of a morning period. Like, oh, you didn't get to do it this month. <laughs> not that we want to be reproducing every month, but um, you guys get the gist of the eggs. Like we're born with a limited supply of eggs and that's all you get, girls. Like no more, no less and, and then, like, I'll let you continue because I think it's so important when people like, oh, women are going crazy about their about their timeline and their biological clocks and people just don't understand. We don't produce eggs every day like you guys produce so much sperm. Yeah, that's true. And the thing is, is that we're maturing later. And so a lot of women are putting off child rearing until, you know, maybe their late 30s and early 40s. And by that time, actually, our eggs are in the geriatric phase. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it. When, That's really sad. We, it is really sad. But when we get our period is the best is the best time to, to for our bodies. That's when our bodies are ready. You know, those next five to 10 years. And it's. Oh, my gosh. Like, I, I know. Can you imagine being a parent at 13? No, no. That's why it's easier to get pregnant when you're younger. I mean, there's just I'm not a fertility specialist, so I don't want to go. No. Into yeah, that, of course. But, but basic information. But, so. Right. So what happens? So so as our eggs age and as our bodies age, right, we're going to make less of the hormones that are involved in reproduction. And our ovaries make those as, as so so does it to our, so do our adrenals, but primarily it's our ovaries. And as we make less and less of the hormones, um, and as as we do that, then also the pituitary will start to make more and more of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and as those become more constant we put out less we don't we don't produce as many eggs and so perimenopause is when you may have you know some mood disturbances some sleep disturbances you're going to have a period it may be regular maybe irregular can't really tell your hormones you know we won't be able to tell what's going on with them uh, until later, right? And then postmenopausal is when you haven't had a period for at least 12 months if you're a woman 50 or older, or 24 months if you're in your 40s. And that's postmenopausal. But that doesn't mean that the symptoms will end. <laughs> it just means that, you know, you're not going to get a period again. And if you do have a period after that time, then you have to see a gynecologist because that's a cancer until proven otherwise. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is when this is around the time you got curious of menopause. You're like, what's happening to me, right? Like <sighs> Yeah. 
so menopause hit me and you know it was like like I had that weird fibroid thing and and then and then I was like I gained a, I so I got lost the fibroid my belly got a little smaller because obviously I had a big mass in my belly but then I started gaining weight and I was like what's going on started trying to exercise it off like I always did in my 30s it wouldn't come off I'm like what the hell and and I was like, I, I don't know what's happening. I was like, I gained 50 pounds overnight, didn't recognize myself, started really hating myself. And and then I was like, well, you're just, you know, you're just fat and you can't control yourself. But that's not it at all. So, uh, you know, I, I if that's how you feel, it's not your fault. I, I, I'm here to testify to that. So so what what I ended up doing was looking for some help. And so I went to Google and I said, she went to Google. Me. <laughs> help me Google I need some help I was I was hoping for a course I mean I actually think I typed in menopause course and what I got was a bunch of scientific journals um, articles about menopause which were great I was able to decipher them but this one said this and this one said that and that one said that and that one and I was like oh shit and so and so I what I did was I said well I guess you know first of all if there's not a course on menopause and I'm a surgeon and I'm smart and I know all about you know medicine in my field why isn't there someone out there talking about this that was the first thing right and then i said i've got to fix this for myself i mean if, if nobody else if i don't fix it for anyone else i got to fix it for myself because i was like none of this is making sense to me this isn't how my understanding of the body is and why wasn't i warned that this was going to happen i went you know i did you know 15 years to you know from from undergraduate through through surgery residency and nobody said that that women are going to go through this period of their lives that is super disruptive and feels weird and so yeah it's i mean it's it a lot of women i mean the menopause movement has surveyed over fifty thousand women in menopause number one weight gain and then after that it has to do with relationships with themselves maybe existential crises um not uh, not being able to make decisions there's just a lot of changes that happen and so that's and that's really how the menopause movement got started. But what I did first was I was like, okay, let's go back to basics. What is the science behind menopause? And I learned all that. And then I said, okay, great. So if hormones are built on cholesterol and cholesterol is built on fat, awesome. That means I need to understand diet. And so I spent a bunch of time really researching the best human diet. And then I was like, okay, Great. So now I know how to eat and I know what's happening science. Before we get there, I just want to ask, yes. in your training of being a surgeon, a doctor, did you learn about nutrition? Did you learn? Like, was that like, because isn't that important? Like, I always wonder, side note, like I have two dogs and they might bark. Sometimes they make a guest appearance on the podcast <laughs> where you yeah. can hear them barking um, and I can't like cut them out sometimes. So when I go to a vet, the first thing they ask, what is the diet? Yeah. How much protein, how much fat, how much fiber. And I've never heard a doctor ask me, what is your diet? How much protein, how much fat, how much fiber, how many calories? Are you walking twice a day? Are you having enough water? But for a dog or a cat, like that is the first thing a vet asks. So I just, I'm very curious. I've never had, I've, well, I had doctors on before, but like we never got to get, get into this conversation. So, um, so I'm a, an osteopath. I, I went to medical school in Southern California, Western University of Health Sciences College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific, which is a really long way to say that uh, I, I have a, some training in some alternative okay. therapies, right? Not, there's no difference between MDs and DOs in terms of like our license and what we can do. That's why I was a surgeon. But I did learn some alternative things, like how to manipulate the body, for example, and, and that. But in my four years of medical school and five years of residency, I got very little nutritional training. And okay. when it comes to understanding nutrition with surgery, there is there are some specific things like we have to fast people. And so the ways to manage somebody who's fasting with IV stuff or feeding somebody who can't use their mouth. Okay. okay. So, so I do have nutritional training on that side, but in terms of what is the best human diet, no training and no training in menopause, nothing. So what, so do you have the best human diet for women? Is that, is that what you're telling me? I teach, I teach what, so, so we have in the Minnow Mastery Academy, we have, um, 
we have a, a basic start, which is called the minnow system, which is basically, okay. um, and, and the women who join are called minnow mates. So it's kind of a community. And so we, we teach four pillars. We've got science, we've got the minnow mate way of eating, which is what, what I consider the best human diet. And it's always evolving based on current uh, evidence. And then we've got the minnow way, mate way of moving, which is what does science tell us about the best ways to move in menopause and how to, how to do it. And especially like uh, I go over a couple of studies that showed the best way to lose the minnow belly. Um, <laughs> the ex- minnow exercise belly, way. I love that. Yeah. And then, um, and then the, 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 the final pillar is the minnow mate way of thinking. And we, we go into that. And we also have the connecting, which is kind of like getting your mojo back, your sexy back, because a lot of women lose that. But the thinking part for me was the, the thing that made the biggest difference. It was how do I hack my subconscious mind to make now the best time of my life? Because I can't change the circumstance of the fact that I'm going through menopause. And I can't change the fact that I get hot flashes when I eat chocolate. It's not going to stop me from eating chocolate or drinking red wine. But at least if I have awareness about it and I can manage the circumstances and decide how I want to react to it and what my reactions are. And so that for me was the most powerful training. And so I do focus a lot of that over the... So the Mental Mastery Academy is a one-year program. And we start with all the basics of menopause, but then we go into like, how can we hack ourselves to create a life we love? Because now's our time. Now, now a lot of women don't have children, don't have either they, 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 they may have like a time to spend with their spouse. They may have extra money to travel once the pandemic goes away. Right. Um, you know, uh, or, or, you know, the kids, the kids are gone or they focused on helping their spouse, you know, with their career. And now, now it's, 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 I mean, I just look at it as it's my time to really shine and do what I want to do and, and, and pay attention to what turns me on. And that's, that's what I do. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. So I love that you decided, and that's like how some of the best things happen, right? You, you, you need help in something. You're like, okay, I'm going to go to the Google right and it's gonna come up i'm gonna search i'm gonna put in some key words i'm gonna put in some key sentences nothing's happening okay i think i need to do this and this this is what you did so i have a few follow-up questions for you do all women experience menopause the same no they don't all women will experience menopause if they live long enough and so i like to reframe menopause as not a time for things to suck but as the privilege of a long life Oh, I love that. Because you know what I say to age? I always say it's a level. And it's like, you got to level 40. You got to level 41. And like, what are the challenges there? Like, what is it that you need to face in level this level to get to the next one? And so it is a privilege. And I love that you say that. So when women get to this level of menopause, yeah. have you... Is it mostly the same? Can you do things before? Like, I wonder if there's like a pre-diet that maybe we can, women can have, like who are in their 30s and 40s to prepare for having an, an maybe like an easier transition, if that's even yeah, a word. I think, I think that's actually a possibility. And the reason I say that is that in, in studying menopause around the world, the Chinese never had a, had a word for menopause until recently. And so I think a lot of it has to do with industrialization and the industrial or standard American diet. And so there's two things that I recommend that everyone cut out of their diet. And not uh, one of them, yes, always. The other one is occasionally, have it occasionally, not all the time. So the first thing I'm going to start with is sugar. Sugar is everywhere. Now, if, if, if you know the history of food policy in America, back in... I'm going to say in the 80s, in the 80s was the biggest, the biggest change. But, you know, late 70s, there was this guy who, his name is Ansel Keys, and he, he decided that fat was the enemy and fat is what caused cholesterol to build up in the arteries. And he did this really bad study uh, called the Seven Country, Seven Nation Study or something. And he wasn't even a, a real food scientist. He, he studied eel electrophysiology. So he wasn't even a real food scientist. He was just a, he was just a real um, dynamic guy. Okay, people followed him, liked him. He was on the cover of Time. Uh, there, there was a, there was a. Congress did a debate about food when he was when he came. Just a whole bunch of stuff. It's a super dynamic guy. 
And he said, okay, fat's it. Fat's the enemy. And we moved our food policy to low fat. And so what happened was what we were, we were eating eggs and bacon and all these natural fats. And we started eating a lot. We had to remove the fats from our diet and from all the manufactured foods. And so what do you have to do to make it taste good is you got to add sugar. And you can see if you look at the incidence and prevalence of diabetes, as we increased the use of sugar in our manufactured foods, the amount of diabetes, it's gone up logarithmically or exponentially, okay? And so, so I do say that if you can take a break from sugar at least, you know, three weeks out of the month and give your pancreas a rest, or even if you can do seasons of sugar, just like we did when we were, when we were evolving, uh, we would have seasons, you know, there would be like three months where we could have sugar, where we could have fruit or honey or those sorts of things. And otherwise, after that, we didn't have it. We had greens and we had meat and, and nuts. So, so that's one thing. And if you can cut back on the sugar that you're eating, and that, that includes, you know, refined carbs as well. So. <laughs> and I'm assuming alcohol. <laughs> well, I'm not even, I'm not even going to alcohol. Alcohol, I don't, I, the only thing, I mean, I don't drink anymore. And if I do drink, I really try to not have much. And the reason is, is that alcohol is a poison. It's not, I mean, yeah, you know, you, you might feel good and you might have your, your inhibitions down and whatnot, but, but at the end of the day, alcohol is a poison and, and it doesn't make us sleep better. It actually disrupts our sleep. And so I found that as, as I started to up my training and, and really get serious about, about my running and my cycling and my swimming, I realized that alcohol was not my friend. And I just, and, and that's not to say I don't have a beer here and there, but I, I'm just saying that, that, um, alcohol, seven gram, seven grams or seven, was it seven calories per gram of alcohol? And it, it's anyway, so yeah, don't drink. We we'll leave it at that. Don't drink, don't smoke. Okay. So, so yeah, second. because, okay. because these are, these are known poisons and then, but sugar, the other thing is, is that just, just on an off note, one of the, one of the sugars that we have that's really, really prevalent in America is uh, high fructose corn syrup. This is speaking of alcohol and high, high fructose corn syrup is metabolized in the liver, just like alcohol is. And so we've seen over the years as, as the prevalence of the use in, in, big products, you know, like the Cokes and the Pepsis, they use high fructose corn syrup and also like Gatorade and those sorts of things. What happens is, is that we've seen a prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's probably related almost, almost a one-to-one -one correlation to the use of high fructose corn syrup in these drinks. And so watch out for that. If you're going to have sugar in your drink, make sure it's cane sugar because it doesn't, it's metabolized differently. So that's, that's just another point about sugar. Wow. So I don't, I don't have any of that. Yeah. So it, it's really, really fascinating uh, because what we, what we started to notice was that there were more and more people having liver problems that didn't drink alcohol. And so we're like, well, what's the commonality there? And the commonality is high fructose corn syrup. But because America is the land of the corporation and the home of the profit, we, we don't. <laughs> I love that you said that. I'm like, should I say the land of the home and the, the free and whatever? No. Yeah. No, it's, it's the land of the corporation, the home of the profit. And, and we might be moving away from that now with our current administration. The last administration was more towards that. But this administration is, is maybe, maybe a little bit more towards, um, you know, human rights and things like that. But at the same, at the same time, we still have to make a profit. And so this is a byproduct of the corn industry. There's a lot of extra corn and we turn it into high fructose corn syrup. The only way that we can affect policy is to vote with our wallets. And so it's really important that we don't buy these things that use it. Oh my God, That's I all. agree. That's the only way. Yeah. And the so, mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> and so the second, the second thing that I tell people to stay away from is any manufactured oil. There's three C's and three S's. And I learned about this from Dr. Kate Shanahan. I recommend everything that she writes. She wrote a couple of really great books, Deep Nutrition, Fat Burn Fix. She's been on my podcast a couple of times. She's really awesome. But uh, three C's, three S's, corn, canola, cottonseed, soy, safflower, sunflower. None of those oils are good for you. It doesn't matter whether it says ex expeller pressed or whether it's a um, organic, any of that stuff. All of that stuff is part of it goes through a solid process where it's plastic. 
and it affects us at, at the epigenetic level. So the very top part of our genes, the part that's really, really changeable based on what we choose to eat. And so that's a, that's a big disruptor. And, and if, if our hormones, so we talked about at the beginning, hormones are based on, they're, they're made from cholesterol and our cholesterol comes from the fats that we eat. And so if we're eating crappy fats, we're giving our bodies crappy building blocks to build our hormones. And so long story short, the reason why they don't have a word for, me for menopause in Chinese is because they never had any of these crappy things until recently. Now, they also have a diet high in soy, uh, and soy is a phytoestrogen, but I don't, I'm not advocating soy. That's, that's not what I'm here to say. Uh, I am saying that the more we put in manufactured foods into our bodies, you know, it's like we're like this big experiment. Go back to natural foods. Nature doesn't make bad fats. Nature doesn't make bad foods. The only bad foods are the things that are, you know, maybe ready for Roundup. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. We were, we're definitely going to have fun on this podcast because, yeah, <clears throat> you're speaking my language, Dr. G. You, and, you know, everyone listening, you guys know how I feel about all this stuff. She's just saying everything that I don't really say all the time, but you guys know that I feel it. So I'm excited about that. So basically, sugar, number one. And number two was the C's and the S's. Uh, the C's and the S's. So it's any seed oils, right? The oils that come from seeds. So basically they are also byproducts of other products, right? And, you know, the cotton seed oil comes from the cotton industry. And they saw that they were just kind of sitting around, got rancid, like, oh, let's, uh, how can we monetize this? And there is actually a full on, like, science on how to make soy oil better for humans. Like there's a whole society wow. on how to make how to make soy soy oil less toxic to humans. You know how you can make it less toxic? Don't freaking consume it. I was just thinking that I'm like, is she gonna say just don't have it? Because that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and and just the the manufacturing process is it's it's like it's part of the the same process that that gas goes through the petroleum. You know, it's just it's it's we're turning something that is a solid into a liquid through hydrogenation and through a chemical process. The thing is, is that because it's a byproduct of another product, it's, it's odorless, it's tasteless, and it's cheap. And so anytime you go out to fast food and get fries, except for five guys, you're going to have fries that are fried in this oil that breaks down. I mean, did you say except for five guys? <laughs> like, wait, what was that? I heard something. Five guys uses peanut oil. And okay. peanut oil is a little bit better. A little bit better, guys. She's not saying go high five, guys. <laughs> Listen carefully uh, in the class of Miss, of Dr. G. Okay, Dr. G, what, um, what are some of the struggles that women most experience during menopause so that we can know what that is? Because a lot of times it's, again, this whole period conversation, this uh, menopause, like all these women things are very stereotype taboo no one talks about that just put your head down be quiet look pretty put your lipstick on like all of these things that we have to experience as women has been shameful like disgusting almost and so we don't really talk about it thank goodness for google and internet where you can like search things and find forums to like go in incognito with like christy 402 <laughs> right like blue j 411 whatever these screen names are um so what are some signs that that women should look out for that are like experiencing menopause like what is what are some of those that, and they're common because like we we're all going to experience some of them at some point and like it's not a taboo thing and i love that we're talking about this because you don't have to hide anymore like it's not yeah. something to be ashamed of well, I want to I want to address the whole thing about periods and why periods are shameful. And I think yeah, the please. periods are shameful because we live in a patriarchy. And, you know, the only things that come out of men are things that come from pleasure or from, def, you know, from like relieve, relieving. Like, so these things that come out of men are, are releases as, in a sense, right? When, when, when women bleed every month, it's a, an inconvenience. To men is that why we have our pink tux <laughs> i don't know i don't know what that means the pink tax is where um women get taxed more oh, for pink tax. pink tax yes 
yeah so pink it and shrink it and all that that's that's still part of the patriarchy i think uh charge more you know for women and you know i mean i always buy, bought male razors and when i was shaving Same. i don't shave much anymore uh, i shave my head you know i use a <laughs> but um but i just you know, we we live and it's not our fault and it's not men's fault it is it is the fault of the way that our brains work and so i think it's really important that we understand this and and there's a book that i read a few years ago and and actually if anyone's ever heard of her uh ani defranco who is a folk singer she comes out of Buffalo. She lives in Louisiana now, but but she she kind of like wrote the soundtrack of my life. And um, I went to see her a couple years ago at this place near me in the in Peekskill, and she said I read this little book called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, and it explained a lot about why we have a patriarchy. And so of course, you know, I being who I am, I had to read the book. And number one, that book is the best religious history text I've ever read. Number wow. One. Number two, it explains why our brains, when, when, when we got written language, we went from living inside of our right brain and being more in a hypnotic state and, and in the being and the feminine to being much, much, much more in the doing and the masculine, right? So written language comes and then, and then the, the male gods murder all the female gods goddesses all right so it's a really beautiful study and it makes sense because if we're always in our left brain it's really hard to be and so we've we've really done this this thing in our society where we have elevated the the do 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 yeah. right but but feminine energy is being feminine energy is just like accepting and and being and and kind of getting in touch with the divine and and that's super super feminine and then not to say that there isn't masculine you know males who don't who are able to do that but they're able to kind of put it all together and so me being the only girl in in a household of boys and and seeing how the girls were always not listened to and pushed down and even even now my brother doesn't even know he does it he he uh I'll say something to him and he just doesn't answer me because that was the way it was done. And so of course I, I got very pushy and pissed off a lot of guys because I got very pushy and then I joined surgery, which is a male dominated thing. But I just want to say that, that the, the point of this is, is that going back to periods is that we don't talk about them because they're inconvenient to men. And it's okay for us to start talking about them and to experience and, and to not, you know. So, so I, think, I think the conversation's starting more about periods. And that's why I started the menopause movement. And there's a lot of women who think menopause is a stigma or that it's a medical condition. And again, like I say, it is the privilege of a long life. There is nothing really medical about menopause. It's just a phase. What happened in Hollywood, you know, with Me Too, before Me Too, it was, you know, if a woman wasn't desirous to, you know, these old gross men, uh, they didn't get jobs. And, you know, people like Helen Mirren and, and Meryl Streep, you know, they're still working because, you know, they're really good at what they do. But there's, there's this whole, I don't know if you've seen it, but it was um, Amy Schumer did a, did a video with Ju Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And it was her last fuckable day. <laughs> no, but I'm going to watch it. Yeah, yeah. I recommend everybody watch that just because it's it's this thought in... in it was the, Amy Schumer's last... Yeah, no, it was Julia Julia Louis-Dreyfus's last fuckable day. And and it's just this whole thought in the, in the industry that, you know, women have an expiration date. And we don't. We just, we get better with age just like wine. I love that. I love that. And... And I just, you know, I get so passionate about these topics and I don't want to go off on a tangent. But when you said, you know, before the Me Too movement and the Hollywood and like how they wanted everyone to like look so young for these like really old men who I kind of like cynically would wish that they're they expired a little bit, too. <laughs> like they didn't produce sperm or whatever. But like that's a whole nother conversation um, in a like Harry Potter world. Right. Um but a lot of these what and even today like with the botox the fillers the plastic surgery is like another whole conversation um as well but when you look at what the 
and I'm doing air quotes right now. So this podcast is video and audio. So you guys get to see like all our facial expressions. And so I just did like our desirable look that we're all going for. It's like they're like childlike features. Have you noticed big eyes, big lips, um, small little button nose? It's really creepy if you look at to like what are these proportions that like we're being told are ideal. And if you compare them to a child, like a little three, four, like if you saw my baby pictures, it looked like what probably people would take to their plastic surgeon. Like my lips are touching my nose. My eyes are big, like Bambi eyes. Um, I have a little button nose and rosy pink cheeks. And you're like, wow, that looks like what filters people want to have on. And when you start looking at this, it's really creepy. Like people want to look like babies, like innocent babies. And that's the kind of look like those big, big, big lips are baby lips. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's the cult of youth and and it's been around forever. And when you when you study like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there there was a cult of youth then. Was there? Oh, yes, yes. And and it's it's really interesting because at the end of the day, the youth youth is wasted on the young. And we That is so true. We age and we start to think, oh my gosh, I wish I'd known that when I was that age. But that's just part of it. I mean, we're here for a short amount of time. We get to borrow this body. It's going to go. We're not. We get to go somewhere else and um, and then maybe come back to learn it all over again, right? And And so I truly believe that there is something eternal in each of us. We all come from the same stuff and some of us are going to learn faster than others. Some of us are going to you know, go, go toward the spiritual. Some of us are going to go towards the other side and whatever it is that's here. I mean, this is, if the truth is what you think about expands, right. And you're able to collapse the quantum field by your thoughts then because, because, okay, I'm just going to go off on a tangent. Go for it. It's coming through. Go for it. Quantum physics for a second. All right. I just want to explain to the audience about quantum physics. So, There's this study called the double slit experiment. Have you heard of it? All right, all right, the double slit experiment. Now I I studied quantum physics in college. I truly did, okay? So, uh, and and it never, I never was able to correlate it to my life. It was all physical chemistry and physics and, and cerebral brain, 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 brain. But there is this whole side of it that's being, right? So the double slit experiment was like, okay, what happens if we are able to observe an electron? And what Einstein taught back in the 20s was that there are things that exist both as a wave and as a particle. So it can exist in space at t- in, in time, but then it's also a wave, okay? So that's how light works. Light is, is also a particle and a wave, all right, fine. Electrons act exactly the same way or much the same way. They're still affected by the gravity of the nucleus, but I digress. If you do the double slit experiment and say, okay, where is this electron in space? You're going to stop it and you're going to see where it is. All right. But then if you're not observing it, it's acting, it's acting as a wave. And so what we've decided is that every, all possibilities exist in this wave and you just need to pluck out the one you want and then you can collapse the field onto the thing you want and and i recently found this to be so true i i'll just give you a quick example i decided i wanted to do a ted talk okay awesome i'm gonna do a ted talk and i start thinking about it and i write it down i'm gonna gonna do a ted talk no idea how to get started whatever turns out one of my actual friends like like a real friend of mine is the number one ted coach in the world oh wow yeah and you didn't know and I didn't know until I decided to do a TED talk simple things like that all right so so there I mean you want to go out on a tangent of of manifesting there's there's a whole world there to talk about but but you know to take away from from I mean we're talking about menopause so we got to get back to that manifesting (laughs) Uh, menopausing and manifesting whatever same yeah, thing is, is that is that we can create the thing is is our brains are so powerful there's this great book by joseph murphy called the power of your subconscious mind and he it was written in the 40s it's or 50s and it's still in print because it's that good the power of your subconscious mind by joseph murphy and it's on audible too but but the thing is is that 
it, when you can start to, and this is what I, this is why I think it's so important for us to see this as women who are in a position to help as we age, right? Because, because the crone was always this, this really, you know, wise woman. And this is where we are now in menopause. If we can stop looking at menopause as a miserable existence that we got to suffer through it. But if we can start to see it as a time to recreate ourselves and to start to see that, that when we, when we, take our thoughts and we say, well, I don't want to think about this. I want to think about that. And we actually put our energy into creating a life we love. We can make it happen. There is no limit because whatever, like this is what um, Napoleon Hill, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve or woman. Yeah. I mean, everything starts with a thought. You just have to continue to focus on it and then take action. Focus, action, small actions, small things. Everything steps. Yeah. And if you can't think of it, like just look around you, right? Like everything was a thought around you, the computer, the screen, the light. Like imagine like a hundred years ago, someone would have said, yeah, you know, like we have a screen and we can see each other from all countries all over the world. And they would look at the person like, are you on, are you okay? Like, do you need help? Do you have a fever? Uh, let's get you some, I don't know, willow bark or something. Like, I think we need to get you some soup and some sustenance or yeah, that, that was inconceivable. And it was a thought and it happened. So like, think about everything, the table, the car, like everything around you was a thought that came into being. So if you all ever get the lost, stuff we're burying ourselves. All in. of it, all of it. The yeah. lotions, the creams, the nails, all of it. This, all of it. Okay. So let's get back on track a little bit before I get into like the the other juicy questions. What are some mistakes? And I don't believe in mistakes. But what are some common, uh, maybe, what's a better word for mistakes? Well, I I still use the word mistakes. Okay. Um, I, th I think women women make makes uh, there's a couple of them and i've already mentioned a few of them yeah number one so so, so i think I'll, I'll give you three some mistakes number, like yeah that people like women do yeah. surrounding menopause because like even for periods right like for a tampons example right like i didn't know how to put a tampon on properly i didn't know that it had to go in you know more and i was like i was yeah. like this is painful what are so women painful. talking about yeah. right like this is horrible like no thank you so <gasps> i like, went through that too <laughs> Right? Like, why? This thing like, is awful. <laughs> yeah. Like, why are they saying it's so much better? I'm very confused. So what are some mistakes like that? Like, I wanted to just give an example. Like, it wasn't a mistake. It's just I didn't know better. And I was scared. And it's scary. And like, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to do this. And what if I die? And toxic shock. And you read all these things. And you f get freaked out. And then you're like, oh, that was nothing. So what are some of those kind of like mistakes that women do surrounding men? Yeah, so I think they, they have to do with perception more than anything else. And so yeah. the first one I would say is that you got to suffer through it, right? And and there is, you know, there there are Facebook groups dedicated to the misery of menopause. And so if if you're going to live your life as a victim of something, that thing is always going to have control over you. And so that, I think, is is the number one mistake that women make. They got to suffer through it. The other one, uh, second one, is that they... Uh, um, sorry. <laughs> I'm glad we're not live. Was it, was it the tampon <laughs> thing no, that threw you no, off? No, no, it wasn't. I just, no, I just, um, so suffer through it and then, oh, that it's a medical condition. And so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of thought out there that, that menopause is a medical condition and that your doctor has to solve it. And at the end of the day, that's why I like to say that menopause is the privilege of a long life because... Every woman is going to go through it if she lives long enough. Some of us sooner, some of us later, but it's still going to be something that we go through. And so that's so important to me. And it was a big reframe for me. And then the third one that I like to say is that it's that you got to take a pill, powder, potion, or patch to get through it. And the only folks who benefit from pill, powders, potions, and patches are the people who manufacture them. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have to. I mean, there are there are things you can do. You can take hormones. If you go to your doctor, get some hormones. Uh, you just want to start early. They're symptom-based. No more than five years. That's the North American Menopause Society position statement on how to do hormone replacement. There are other things you can do. There's some new treatments coming out for hot flashes. Hot flashes can be super, super disruptive. Uh, but 
most of the time right now, the treatment for hot flashes is a ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And so if you've been, been prescribed one of those, one of the side effects is difficulty with orgasm. And if you're having, if you're taking that and you're having difficulty with orgasm, now you know why, because your doctor's not going to tell you that. But you just did. I just did. Yeah. Thank you. Because, because I'm the myth buster. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And everyone else thanks you. <laughs> the thing is, is that if, you, if you're on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor for hot flashes, uh, and this is not medical advice, this is just some practical tips, don't stop it immediately. Don't stop it by it. So you got to make sure that you, um, that you taper off of it because if you stop it suddenly, you can have suicidal ideation and we want you to stick around. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's super important. So definitely listen to the rest of this podcast <laughs> and we'll put this on replay. Um, it's probably going to be around minute, like 50 or something like that. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. And that's good to know, but we are a beauty podcast, okay. right? And I want to know your definition of beauty. For, for me, I think that the biggest beauty for me has to do with my thoughts. When I, when I can look in the mirror and, and tell myself that I love myself, when I can look in the mirror and, and, I mean, for the longest time I looked in the mirror and said, I hate you. And I don't have to do that anymore because this body, this 56-year-old, almost 57-year-old body can run seven, eight miles at a time if I want, to, if I want it to. I couldn't do that when I was 18. You know, and I've, I've trained myself to, you know, to just start to love and see where I can go with this body. Yeah, no, I love that. You know, menopause almost sounds to me like the way you're describing it and I'm feeling it. I'm actually excited to when I, when I do go through menopause, it's like a, another chance where you're like, don't have these um, hormones telling you like, you need to have a baby, you need to have a baby because subconsciously I feel like there's some pressure like every time you have a period, you're like, oh, it didn't happen. Not that you want it maybe all the time, but like it's like a biological thing, you know, yeah. that your body goes through. And that's like there's some 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 subconscious programming there that like that's kind of like what we're here to do on an animalistic level. And now that you don't have that anymore, you get an opportunity to be free of that and just like do the work that you're doing. So I'm excited. I'm excited, yeah. excited to see what kind of work I'm going to be called to be doing at that time. There is this whole instinctual bit that, you know, we, we, we need to procreate and we don't have any choice over that. That's just, that's, that's, that's hardware we, that we can't change that. I mean, we can change a lot about our subconscious minds, but the hardware that we're wired to, that we're wired to reproduce, that's, that's got to stay, right? And, and I remember when I got pregnant, I was so relieved because, and, and I went off the pill and got pregnant in two weeks. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was just really relieved. I got pregnant and then I just, I, I thought, I, I thought about it and then I was so happy when I was, when I was done and because periods were so awful for me. And so it was so freeing to not have a period anymore because they were just, they were just really, really disruptive in my life. But, you know, speaking of instinctual, so my favorite part about having a baby was breastfeeding. That was, I loved breastfeeding and I loved the feeling. You know, I did feel like a cow and I could have probably fed four children. I mean, I, I, had, a, I had a lot of breast milk. But, but the thing that I loved the most that was so interesting to me as a, you know, just kind of as a fact finder, cerebral person that I had zero control over. When a baby cried, the milk would come. Didn't really? matter whether my baby was around. Didn't matter what it was. And, and I didn't feel it. Just, just a baby would cry and down would come the milk. I was, I was flabbergasted. Wow. Yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I just, and, and I'd read about it. And so it was really cool to experience that and just be like, there are, you know, there is a part of us that is animal. In the beauty circle, which is a tool that I developed and it has 10 different categories and it kind of helps you see where you're at at the moment. You could do it daily, monthly, whatever. I, I say monthly, but some people do it weekly depending on their goals. And it, it's like water intake, bowel movement. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. I asked like, where is there a category that you feel like you're excelling in? You're like, I got this. It's movement, it's sleeping, it's bowels, it's relationships. Um, you can interpret that any which way you like. And then where is there a category that you're lacking? It could be, like I said, water intake. It could be sleep. It could be spirituality, right? Like you said, you had a whole thing where you were an atheist and now you're, you're spiritual. So 
I, I we want to know because I firmly believe that we're always a work in progress. There isn't a destination. There's a journey, and it could look different every day. Today I could be the best in all categories, and tomorrow I'm like, you know, I don't feel like moving my body today, and that's totally fine. But I want people to relate to us, to me, to you, to the to whoever is on, to know that you're also a person having a human experience, and wh- where are you like at today? For me, I'm I'm really good with movement, and I'm I'm training right now for the Falmouth Road Race, which is a seven mile race from Woods Hole to Falmouth, and it's now one of the big, biggest races. And, and it's small this year. There's there are only eight thousand people running it. Wow, still yeah, a lot of people. So, yeah, it's still really big for for a pandemic year. I f- I always feel like my relationships could use work. My bowel movements are happy. I was actually grateful for a bowel movement today. Um, I actually, it's really funny that you mentioned bowel movements because, like, I was like, oh yeah. And, and I actually remember like flushing it and being so thankful that it was so easy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, sometimes. So yeah. Yeah. So so I when I had that uterine artery ablation, it hurt a lot because that fibroid was degenerating. And I was taking Percocet because it hurt a lot. And so the Percocet didn't make me sleepy. It took away the pain and it worked. And then I had to poop. And, I, and it was like five days later and I still couldn't poop. And I was like, it's right there. Why would it come out? And, and I actually, actually disimpacted myself. I actually pulled it all out. So embarrassing and so gross. Wow. And, and so if, you, if you're somebody who's done that, I've been there. I've done that too. Yeah. And I felt so much better afterwards, but I felt so gross and, and, and like a failure and like all these emotions that were coming through my mind because I felt so, oh, like, why can't, why can't my body just work for me? So another thing I asked, like we're coming towards the end of the podcast and something that I ask every single person completely off topic is what's one advice that you would have given younger Dr. G, maybe before you were Dr. G from today when you're, you're at level, what, 56? I'm level 56. You're level 56. What would you have told your younger version? Like the younger, well, maybe level, I don't know, 15, 20? Um, yeah, I would go to 18 and I would okay. tell my 18 year old self to uh, stop smoking and to keep running, to not stop running. Yeah, I, I quit because I, I had open heart surgery and I was so nervous about it, I started smoking again. And then at the end of, you know, I just never went back to running and. <laughs> and then I kept smoking. And so that's what I would tell her. I love that. That's really yeah. good advice. Guys, keep mm-hmm. running. Stop smoking. You, yeah. That's still applicable today. <laughs> so we have a section called brag time. I have everyone brag about themselves because I've noticed that all of the amazing people that I've interviewed that I come across are super humble. They're doing amazing work in their life and they're not used to bragging about themselves. They're kind of just there to help and be of service, but no one ever tells them, brag about yourself. Tell me what you're up to. What are you doing? Do you have a new course? Did you learn how to play the guitar with your toes? Are you painting with your nose? Like, tell me, like, if you learn anything, this is an opportunity for you to tell me and our audience what are you excited about? What do you want to brag about? Like, do you now, like, I don't know, can you sing from your nose? Like anything that is interesting about yourself that you're proud of and that you're, you know, that you're up to, please tell us. All right. Well, floor I, studied, is yours. I studied classical voice for like 15 years and I was a coloratura soprano in college. Wow. Until I went to science. Very so cool. That's, that's, so I can sing, but I don't. I sing, I sing like, I used to sing in the OR, you know, when the, when the, when the songs came on, when I was operating. Um, oh, really? So like, so people have heard you sing like in the OR? Oh, yeah. Not, you know, I, I, I had this really bad stage fright and, and I just didn't want to get over it. I didn't care that much about it. And I, and, and it just wasn't, I don't know. I wanted to do something that was harder than sing. Okay. So I wanted a bigger challenge and medical school seemed like a bigger challenge at the time. Uh, the other thing that I'm super proud of is because of what we what we show women inside of the uh, Mental Mastery Academy, we have women who are creating lives that they never thought, never thought they could create. We have women who never thought they could buy a house. I mean, because remember, we're talking about women who are in their late 50s, 60s, and sometimes in their 70s, and maybe younger. I mean, we have some younger people, too, who show up, but... Um, 
you, you know, but but the average age of, of menopause is 51. So we've got, you know, women between the age of, like, you know, 45 to 70 in, in, the, in the program. But they're doing things that they, they never, ever thought they could do. They're, they're starting to, like I have one, one woman who is going back to graduate school uh, because she'd always thought about it but never took any action. And another one who is selling her house because, well, I want to live on a rocky shoreline and if I live on the bayou, I can't, you know. And, and I've got another one who, um, you know, once, once I started showing her that she could have anything she wanted, she's like, well, I want to buy a house. And she did at like 65, first time. Yeah. So, so it isn't so much, you know, and then we also have the things that happen. Like, like once, once you, once you go through our programming, women lose a lot of weight. They start to, their relationships with themselves and their, their significant others improve dramatically because, because they're starting to pay attention more. Um, and then I have another woman who, who has, uh, we, has fibromyalgia and she got off of 80% of her medication in the six, first six months of being in my program. So it's, menopausemovement.com forward slash beta join b-e-t-a-j-o-i-n will take you to the the application it's a lengthy application and you have to agree to give me a testimonial and uh, feedback and you can you can join it and you can go through the whole thing and of course there's going to be an offer to join the minnow mastery academy at the end but the but it's it's all about showing you how to get through menopause naturally i love that and where can our listeners find you menopausemovement.com and do you have any socials, Facebook, Instagram? Uh, so Instagram and Facebook are D-R-M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-G-O-R-D-O-N. Both of them. At Dr. Michelle Gordon. Twitter's Michelle E. Gordon. I'm on Clubhouse at D-R-G, but I'm not on Clubhouse very often. And then I'm, I'm on TikTok at Dr. Michelle Gordon. Same. Oh, D-R okay. Michelle Gordon. Perfect. Yeah. I have four videos on TikTok. <laughs> So definitely connect with Dr. G. Check out the beta testing program. I will have all the links in the show notes. And thank you again for your time. This was so fun. I cannot wait for a part two for our live, for our clubhouse, and for whatever else is there for us to collaborate on. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so, so much for staying till the end. I hope that you learned a lot today and please share this episode with any woman or anyone who would benefit from this. But most importantly, if you have a mom, an aunt, a grandma, a neighbor, a coworker, anyone in your life who you think would benefit from this, who this information is crucial and it is so easy. All you have to do is click share on the bottom of the podcast if you're watching this on YouTube you can share it and text it to the person or give it to them on whatsapp but really truly check out dr gordon she has a podcast as well which i'm going to link in the bottom and check out what she's doing because i think it is truly truly amazing to talk about these things and we shouldn't have shame around them please share this with any woman in your life anyone that you know so the more we know the more we can handle life and really breeze through it in in the best way that we can so thank you so much for tuning in and if you feel called to please subscribe write a review tell me what you're thinking if you have a topic that you want to know about please send me a message and i will try my best to get that expert on here enjoy the rest of your day bye guys